based on their desire to not speak publicly about their case. And we should most definitely never take the government's word about what a person in prison is doing or the decisions they are making. As frustrating and confusing as it is, dealing with arrest and imprisonment often means long periods of waiting and uncertainty. When we jump to conclusions, we run the risk of damaging our communities, the work that we do, and the people with whom we have relationships. And of course, the flip side to this is that we need to remember, when people don't snitch and hold strong against the state, they should be celebrated and supported. And this support should start early on. When grand jury resistors are supported, we not only lay the groundwork for strong support networks should indictments come down, but we can also potentially prevent indictments from coming down in the first place. Supporting resistors sends a strong message that when people are targeted by the state, we will be there to take care of them every step of the way. Security culture. It's not about snobbery, fashion, or being mean to new people. And it's not about paranoia. The practice of security culture, when done well, keeps us all safer and makes it so that the informants in our midst have a much harder time getting the information they're looking for. It's less of a problem if they're tapping your phone and your email, which you should assume they are. If you don't say anything via those mediums, they can get yourself or, other in tr or others in trouble. And security culture ain't dead, or it shouldn't be. It's not only bragging that should be discouraged, indirect bragging, the practice of maybe acting like as much of a sketchball as possible so that everyone within earshot and beyond knows that you're up to something even if you're not actually saying what it is, is almost as bad. We don't need to be playing up our sketchiness to try to establish some kind of credibility. We're sketchy enough as it is. Let's only use it where it counts and not play it up where it doesn't. We also shouldn't be speculating about the behavior or activities of other folks. It's just not necessary, and it causes all kinds of trouble, not in a good way. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, did you say speculate, speculate as to what they're doing or if they're a snitch themselves? I would say both, actually. Um, it's generally, probably, as Jenny said, not good to call people snitches unless you like really have a smoking gun indicating that they're snitches. And it's also not a good idea to speculate about other folks' activity and what they might be involved in. Um, because, you know, those things can potentially give the FBI information that leads into what to investigate, and it's also just sort of not necessary. Um, in an era of evolving discourse about open revolt versus clandestine action, some people think that this stuff doesn't matter anymore. Some people think that we're all going to end up in camps, so it doesn't matter anyway. But it does, because we're not there yet. We're not yet in an era of open revolt in which folks aren't getting into trouble for this stuff, as perhaps, you know, some of these stories that we've been telling might indicate. We need to be as safe as we can be while we're in this phase of struggle that we're in right now. Because repression is a phase of struggle. It happens. It's real. The state represses people. It's what they do. We shouldn't be surprised when repression comes down. We need to be prepared for it before it happens thinking about it as a component of our political strategy and deciding what we're going to do. So then when it does happen, we're not constantly caught by surprise and having to fly by the seat of our pants in response. Often rep repression and anti-repression work are divorced from the central work of political campaigns. Maybe some sort of specialized legal workers, maybe like us, will maybe form a collective to maybe give a know your rights training, talk about this stuff, maybe deal with the fallout after it happens. But really, everybody needs to be doing this work and dealing with this stuff because it affects us all. We need to have a knowledge, not just among legal workers, but everyone, of how the legal system works in order to protect ourselves as much as we can and give ourselves as much agency as we can so that when cops and lawyers and the government are like throwing huge uh, obscure terms at you and these things are going to affect the future course of your life, you're going to know what they mean and be able to make the best choices you can. It's easier to make decisions about considering repression in our larger strategies when we know about the state and how this stuff works. And we need to be transparent in the face of repression. If a cop or the FBI harasses you, you shouldn't be quiet about it and keep it to yourself, thinking that if you lay as low as possible, maybe they'll leave you alone and it'll go away. It really doesn't work that way. They're kind of like cockroaches. They run from life. So that if you shine a light on these things by, for example, calling your friends and telling them that the FBI or whoever have been harassing you, or maybe telling the people in your group or whatever it is that you're up to, 
then other people will know not only that it's happening to you, but to watch out for it happening to them too. And if we document these patterns, we can figure out exactly what they're up to and try to you know, learn from them and figure out what to do from there. If there are cops or the FBI lurking around your neighborhood, you can alert your neighbors and tell them that there are neighborhood creepers lurking around and that everybody needs to watch out for them. This works particularly well when there are children in the neighborhood. Um, and we need to make links with other folks to facilitate these points. Because as Jenny said, we're not the only people to have done this work. We're not the only people doing it now. I think there is a tendency in our communities to sort of shy away from talking about this idea of don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Um, I would actually assert that this sort of honest conversation is really necessary because despite what you might have heard, prison is really hard and it's supposed to be. Anybody who is thinking about being involved in work that might land them in prison needs to take this into consideration and think seriously about their ability to withstand this sort of pressure. And that pressure is almost always most intense immediately after a person's arrest, all the way up until trial or until they take a plea. Um, there's a reason for that. The state does not want to take these cases to trial. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. They would much rather somebody take a plea, saves them a lot of time and money, and also helps them cultivate new informants so they can open new cases. Withstanding this kind of pressure is a really amazing feat, and not everybody is capable of it. Eric recently wrote, I was personally prepared for what came with isolation. Having done the necessary work on myself, the internal exploring, healing, and nourishing needed to survive and dance with the trauma of being raised in this culture. With the effects from the shock and continuous trauma of being caged, all I would have had to fall back on would be those culturally programmed traits we're all raised with, such as identification with the oppressor, mob mentality, and submission to authority. My receiving those weekly stacks of mail did wonders which I'm perpetually grateful for. But without the anchor of knowing, loving, and being aware of who I am, how could I have stayed true to the intentions of my heart? When people don't have this sense of self, they end up, and they end up like Eric's co-defendants, cooperating with the state and basically screwing over the people they supposedly care about. In his sentencing statement to the court, Zach Jensen wrote, During the time I was a part of the movement, I was among peers who accepted and loved me. I found validation and security among these people. However, I would later learn after pleading guilty, after getting away from them to have my own thoughts, that these people accept you for your ideology rather than your essential self. It seems that Zach identified his participation in the movement as more a matter of happenstance, void of any political underpinnings um, or philosophical underpinnings. He was there because he felt accepted and validated. And it's certainly reassuring that our communities feel open to people who might have felt alone and isolated before, but we need to be realistic about the implications of that when thinking about who we, will not, who we will and will not work with when the repercussions have the potential to be so severe. Jensen was a pleasant fellow, to be sure. I was actually rather fond of him before he flipped on Eric, um, but he never really struck me as somebody that you could depend on in a pinch. He had a very flimsy sense of self, which is why Anna was so successful at manipulating him and keeping him involved in the alleged conspiracy, even though, by his own admissions, it was not anything he really wanted to do. What I'm trying to get at here is the importance of having the strength to base our words and our actions on our own internal realities, recognizing when other people do and do not do that, and then choosing to work only with the former group. Without a deep-seated connection to the things we fight for and the people that we fight with, we will never be able to withstand the pressure that the state puts on us. We need to recognize, think about, and talk about the role that privilege has played in many of these green scare cases, specifically how easy it is for folks to reintegrate after they mess up. When people still feel like they have something to lose, whether it be a good job or a wealthy family or whatever, and they feel like they can get that all back by simply betraying their friends and their principles and their integrity, it becomes much easier for them to dissociate. This movement is largely young, white, and middle to upper class. This is not to say that all anarchists are these things, but when we look at the specific Green Scare cases and the folks that cooperated in these cases, a very clear pattern emerges. When the going gets tough, many get going. Because they can. Because they have something else to go back to. We would actually assert that this is a false notion, because soon there won't be anything folks, for folks left to go back to at all. I sincerely hope that everybody here is doing the work they do, because they have no other option. 
because their hearts won't let them do anything else. Any other motivation is dishonest and dangerous. It's dangerous because unless we're really committed, we won't be able to withstand the pressure of the state when repression intensifies, and it will. What we're asking for from all of you is some serious soul searching. Do it now before you end up in jail, uh, because then obviously it's too late. It's not that we want to scare you here, at least not completely. Not to scare you into becoming anonymous, into hiding, into not organizing or telling our stories. Do what you need to do. Be smart, and be careful about who you do it with. We want you to consider repression and considering your actions, and to do what you think makes sense. No one is safe. It's 2012, y'all. The world is ending. We have no future in this world. We do, or we should, have each other. What does it make sense to do at this point? We want to put forward one more idea. June 11th, the International Day of Solidarity with Marie Mason, Eric McDavid, and long-term anarchist prisoners. This year will be the second annual June 11th. Last year was the first, sort of. June 11th began in 2004 as an International Day of Solidarity with, at that time, long-term anarchist prisoner Jeff Free Lures. At the time, Jeff was serving 22 plus years for torching three SUVs at a car dealership in Eugene, Oregon to protest the destruction of the earth. The sentence imposed on him was intended to send a clear message. After years of struggle, Jeff and his legal team won a reduction in his sentence. He was released from prison in December 2009, having served nine of the 22 years that he was originally sentenced to. In the years intervening Jeff's arrest and his release, the FBI <coughs> began to carry out the Green Scare. Two of the people caught up in this repression were Eric McDavid and Marie Mason. In light of Free's release, June 11th resumes as a day of international solidarity with Marie Mason and Eric McDavid, who share the unfortunate distinction of having the longest standing sentences of any environmental prisoners in the United States. <coughs> Free began his sentence as a long-term anarchist prisoner. Now his release represents what we want for all long-term pris anarchist prisoners. We want them out. June 11th serves as a particular day to think about Marie and Eric and to look at where we've been in terms of repression and where we are now. It's not intended to be a single letter writing day, so you know you've done your bit of service that one time for Eric and Marie. Instead, it's a day during which they can't slip from our minds, and the history of, our, of repression that affects our present can't slip away either. June 11th serves as a yearly check-in to ask where are we now in terms of repression and anti-repression. It happens every year so we can keep doing it over time, so that we can keep being there over time. June 11th is an opportunity for more of us to begin consciously not to treat solidarity as a burden, but rather to create ways to keep Marie and Eric present in our lives, to facilitate Marie and Eric's political voice and engagement outside of prison, to develop relationships with Eric and Marie if we haven't done so already, to create opportunities to link together struggles, and to have a concrete starting point for building momentum against prison and prison society. Last year, as I said, was the first annual June 11th. All over the world, people did events of various kinds. In many places, they raised thousands of dollars for Eric and Marie using tactics such as bake sales, vegan dinners, silent auctions, raffles, the creation of new shirts, zines, and materials for Eric and Marie, and other things. People tabled at bookstores, farmers markets, at parks, and outside. People had letter writing nights, both at events and at one point in an outdoor cafe so that not only the attendees wrote to Marie and Eric, passersby did too. People in one city took pictures of the people at the event there holding signs that said, I support Marie Mason and I support Eric McDavid, and sent them to Marie and Eric to have a physical reminder of folks out there who were thinking of them. People heard talks from former prisoners who talked about their experiences in the prison system, did educational events about Marie's and Eric's cases on Green Scare, in other places, people did creative events, such as the reading of the play Accidental Death of an Anarchist and the staging of a drag show. Marie telephoned one of the organizers of the Detroit event, and everyone shouted hello at the telephone for her. My city, Minneapolis, did a teleconference with Jenny, who made everybody cry. In some places, people had other ideas about what made sense for themselves, their friends, networks, crews, and communities to do in solidarity with Eric. Solidarity actions. In Argentina, ATMs were burned in solidarity with Marie Mason, Eric McDavid, and other prisoners and combatants. In Peru, there was an arson of a church in solidarity with comrades of the social war Marie Mason and Eric McDavid. I think they like black metal in Peru. Cambridge, UK, bank action in solidarity. Finland, railway sabotaged. In Olympia, logging equipment was sabotaged. 
In Russia, the ELF, the Informal Anarchist Federation, and the International Network claimed a series of attacks in solidarity with Marie, Eric, and long-term anarchist prisoners. In Tacoma, a development building and bank were visited. In Seattle, an SUV was attacked in solidarity. There were banners hung in Greece. These stories are only a small sampling of what happened on June 11th last year, but they are representative of the kind of creativity, diversity, and energy that we would like to see poured into prisoner support, not just on June 11th, but every day of the year. We're not telling people to go out and burn churches or whatever. We are saying that we want June 11th to be a starting point, not an end in itself. We hope that everyone takes this opportunity to feel re-energized and recommitted to the work that they do, to their communities, to their friends, lovers, and comrades who are being held hostage by the state. This year, people in some cities are already planning activities for June 11th. Bloomington is planning a vegan cupcake bake-off. Minneapolis is planning a microphone demo. We'd like to encourage you to do an event in your community, too. Let's make June 11th big and awesome, this year and every year, and do what we can every day for Marie, Eric, and Launch America's prisoners. Thanks. So, what to say after all that? Um, we don't want you to leave here feeling defeated, but this is some really heavy shit. Um, Eric, and Marie, Eric and Marie aren't getting out anytime soon, short of collapse or total anarchist triumph, if I repeat myself. Prison and prisoner support is a phase of resistance that we all must take seriously, both in our actions that we take here on the outside and the methods of support that we give to those on the inside. And June you know, 11th is coming up soon. It will be a day to keep Eric and, Marie, Eric and Marie in our hearts, to make sure that no one should be able to walk down any street without seeing our comrades' names written on the walls. And the songs that are sung about them must be heard by all. So while this day is billed as a single day in solidarity with long-term anarchist prisoners, let it be a beginning, a day, yes, but also a new strategy for dealing with repression for the people who have been stolen from us for decades at a time. Much like we hope May Day, would be feared by all authoritarians and capitalists everywhere. <laughs> Let this June 11th be a new start, one that the society that creates these prisons would fear, and one that will catch on and spread <coughs> like a fire. Thank you. You should turn that off. Okay. <laughs>